Now we turn to Bhutan, uh, and Bhutan we know is famous for the GNH, the Gross National Happiness, uh, and the title of this uh, talk uh, has a question mark around it because we want to know to what extent is this the case, how happy is Bhutan? Uh, I was recently in Bhutan, so in the same seminar with um, Tanji, uh, Tashi, and there are there is an, a small army of Bhutanese uh, intellectuals and scholars at the Center for Bhutan Studies who, you know, they do surveys on the uh, happiness indicators. They, there's actually a very systematic uh, effort to, to provide happiness to people. At the same time, I think that you will agree, Tashi, there's a lot of pressure from below. Young people, uh, there's some bars in Timpu, the capital of Bhutan, they want to have uh, more access to uh, Western fashions. Uh, how has Bhutan got here? I think it had a, a monarchy that had an application, had a constitution, allowed elections, so doing things without being forced to do it, Bhutan. The monarchy did things that, that it was not forced to do. Uh, and now, where is it going? Is it GNS, the Gross National Happiness, really the way ahead? Uh, and are people really happy? So, ta Tachi, the floor is yours. Hello. A very good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, ISIS uh, Thailand and the Chulalongkorn University for inviting me here to talk on gross national happiness. I would like to extend my special thanks to Dr. Thitnan and his team for making this forum possible. And my greetings from the people of Bhutan to everyone present here. All of you, all of you would know that gross national happiness, GNH, is the development philosophy of my country, Bhutan. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. But before I move on to GNH, I would like to briefly introduce Bhutan for the benefit of those who may not know much about my country. I'll go a bit uh, back in history. Bhutan was unified for the first time in the, only in the 17th century. Uh, a Tibetan Lama by the name of Ngawang Namgyal was holding an important seat in a uh, estate in uh, Tibet uh, and was recognized there as a reincarnation of an important Lama. However, a controversy arose Following, a, uh, following another claimant who also claimed to be the real reincarnation and uh, the second candidacy was supported by very influential people in Tibet. Uh, uh, following that, Ngawang Namgyal had to flee to Bhutan in the year 1616 and uh, I think that's when the history of Bhutan actually begins in the year 1616. At that time there were several other Buddhist sects in Bhutan. Ngawang Namgyal went and goes on to defeat almost all of them and unifies Bhutan for the first time. Then this Lama was given the honorific title of the Shabdrung which means at whose feet one submits. The Shabdrung went on to establish a dual system of governance under a legal code under which control and authority of the country was shared between two leaders, one spiritual and one secular and administrative leader. The present day governance is still a modified version of this dual system of governance that he started. The legal code under which the Jabdung ruled the country usually credited as the 1929 legal code declares that, in quote, if the government cannot create happiness, 
for its people, there is no purpose for the government to exist. After unifying the country, the Shabdun died in 1651. I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit too back to in history. He was so popular at that time when he died in 16, uh, 1651 that his, the news of his death was kept a secret for 54 years. And uh, a small group of people, his trusted people who ruled the country, uh, let everyone in the country believe that he was in silent meditative retreat. The reason for keeping the news a secret was simple. They wanted to avoid a power struggle in the country. And to make things worse, the Shabdum was a Buddhist monk and he did not have any legal heir. He was not married. After the news of his death became public, what was expected happened. The country was ruled by many other leaders and Bhutan recorded a very bloody history during this period. By the beginning of the 20th century, one man had become the most powerful and influential figure and he was ruling the country. He was essentially ruling the country from central Bhutan. And in 1907, 1907, all power centers in Bhutan decided to consolidate the country and unanimously made him the first king of Bhutan. It was only in 1907. That was the birth of the monarchy and also the birth of a new and peaceful country. If we take stock of Bhutan's history today, we can see that the intent with which Bhutan became a monar monarchy has been a successful story. Since then, we have had five kings, and each of them has been a symbol of unity for the country. Each has been selfless and giving. Each king of Bhutan has placed the interests of the country before his own, and we, the people of Bhutan, love and respect our kings. We pray for our kings before we pray for ourselves because we are fortunate to have kings who we consider in the spirit of being Buddhists, true bodhisattvas. And it is not their blood, but their actions that deserve such an accolade. So, uh, since then, we, uh, we have had, you uh, you would be knowing, we have had five kings. The fourth king, His Majesty Jimmy Sengi Wanchu, uh, became the king in 1974 when he was 19 years of age and when he was 51 years old in 2006 he handed over the kingship to the current king his majesty Jimmy Kesanangi Wanchu so figuratively speaking we have two kings in Bhutan Bhutan opens itself to the world even after Bhutan became a monarchy, it remained an isolated country to the world, apart from few occasional journals written by British explorers and more infrequent news reports by the international media. Hardly anything was known about Bhutan by the outside world. Its policy of self-imposed isolation was not to hide itself from the world, but there was no pressure to open itself in the early 20th century. The extreme geography also contributed to the isolation with the Himalayas in the north restricting easy access to Tibet and the tropical southern borders making it ex uh, a heaven for tropical diseases like malaria and dengue deng and, uh, and thus it was not really habitable in the southern border to India. By the middle of the 20th century, Bhutan was forced to wake up to the realities which came in the form of the upheaval in the north following the Tibetan, sorry, sorry, the Chinese invasion of Tibet and in the south uh, with, the, with India becoming an independent country. So it was only in 1961 that Bhutan became, uh, Bhutan opened itself to the world and it did so by initiating the first ever five-year plan, only in 1961. Ten years later, Bhutan joined the UN and that was a big development. Now I will talk about birth of GNH. Just one year after becoming the member of the UN, the third king passed away in 1972, leaving a 17-year heir apparent who waited for two years before he, he was formally crowned king. When His Majesty Jimmy Sengi Wanchu became king in 1974, 
Bhutan was still an agrarian economy. Modern infrastructure like roads was being built for the first time through its mountainous terrain and development with the development assistance from India. Literacy level in modern education was very low and there were just a handful of university graduates in the country. Bhutan was basically dealing with the basics in modern development in 1972. Outside Bhutan, the global economy was not faring well at the time either. 1973-74 was the time when the world saw the beginning of the 1970s recession and one of the worst stock market crashes of modern times, particularly affecting the UK and all the major stock markets around the world. Back home, a young teenager king was building a vision for his poor country and preparing it to brace the challenges of modern development. Those were also the days when the king mostly taught the country on horseback and mingled with the people, mostly villagers around campfires at night and drank water from natural springs. His Majesty Jimmy Senge Wanchu made his vision clear in almost all such informal meetings with his mostly illiterate citizenry and, his, and the civil servants. The message was clear and simple. It was that the happiness of the people is more important than economic development. At almost every informal and formal meeting, he, His Majesty outlined his vision for the country with the same message. In one of my interviews with the current Prime Minister of Bhutan, Jimmy Waitile, who is credited as the GNH ambassador to the outside world, he agreed that there is no single incident recorded as the first time when His Majesty asserted his philosophy of development or the idea of GNH. His ma uh, the Prime Minister, Jimmy Whitingley, told me in quotes, it was during these unrecorded and informal occasions over campfires during his travels throughout the country that His Majesty repeatedly alluded to the need for the government and the leaders to aspire to give to the people what they needed and desired the most, and that is happiness. In the global media, His Majesty is usually credited for coming up with the philosophy when he became king in 1974. While it is not completely false, it is not completely true either. The scope of this new development philosophy did not get immediate attention initially, not even in Bhutan. How GNH got its name? It will not be wrong to say that His Majesty was rather pro probed to give his development philosophy a name in English. And not surprisingly, it happened outside Bhutan. In 1979, 79, His Majesty was returning from the sixth NAM summit in Havana, non-aligned movement summit in Havana. And at the Bom Bombay airport in India, he gave a rare interview to a group of Indian journalists. One reporter asked, we do not know anything about Bhutan. What is your gross national product? His Majesty very casually replied, we do not believe in gross national product because gross national happiness is the most important is more important so usually this interview is credited as uh, his majesty giving the name GNH for the first time ever it was only in 1987 on the May 2nd edition of the Financial Times of London that a journalist by the name of John Elliott wrote an article called the modern part to enlightenment it, this news article is the first article ever to highlight GNH as the development philosophy of Bhutan. It was only in 1987. John Elliott, in his blog, which is uh, the writingtheelephant.wordpress.com, he writes about meeting the king. In, uh, he writes only in 2008, his experiences of meeting the king. He writes, when I met the shy and assuming but dignified king in his ornate Timbu Palace, he worried about how to develop the country, how to open it up, but not so fast as to be disruptive while maintaining Bhutan's traditions and peaceful Buddhist culture. In a paternalistic way, he was clearly agonizingly aware of the enormity of his existence, sorry, of uh, his inheritance, and that his decisions could make or break his tiny nation. The research, the research organization in Bhutan responsible for uh, developing mathematical indicators to measure GNH 
uh, as Dr. Titanan rightly pointed out, the Center for Bhutan Studies. Also records this article as the first ever in international mention, written evidence of GNH. Uh, the CBS, founded in 1999, has de developed mathematical parameters to measure GNH and has measured it in Bhutan twice. It uses a nine step method of multi dimensional poverty by Alkair Foster to measure the GNH index. It was only in 1998 that Bhutan decided to consciously share its philosophy with the outside world, only in 1998, when the current Prime, Prime Minister Jimmy Waitinle, serving in the same capacity then, mentioned GNH as an alternative development paradigm at the Asia Pacific Millennium Summit in Seoul. Around the same time, in 1998, it is also interesting to note that the global economy was not, again, once again, not doing well. There was the Asian financial crisis, which began here in Thailand in July 97, and went on to affect most Southeast Asian countries, including Japan, Indonesia, and South Korea. It also came in the aftermath of the 94 Mexico economic crisis. Moreover, the 90s was uh, marked by international financial crisis, and the decade ended with a crisis in Brazil. Turkey and, uh, and also Argentina. Uh, it was only in 2004 that uh, Bhutan organized the first international conference on GNH in Thimphu. The second one followed the subsequent year in Canada and since then it has, gone, uh, it has organized five GNS seminars so far with the third one in, here in Bangkok in 2007, the fourth in Bhutan and uh, the fifth in Brazil in 2009. It was only in 2005 that Bhutan decided to quantify happiness and gave the responsibility to CBS, the Center for Bhutan Studies. The same year in 2005, His Majesty Jimmy Senge Wanchu declared on Bhutan's national days, December 17th, his intentions to abdicate in 2008 in favor of his son, the Crown Prince. One year later, on 14th of December, three days before the National Day, His Majesty shocked the nation when he declared that he would be handing over the responsibilities of the King to the Crown Prince immediately. He also ordered the first democratic elections to be held in 2008. In 2008, when Bhutan became a democracy, the CBS finally came out with the mathematical formula to, to measure GNH the same year. Last year, in July 2011, it was a big moment for Bhutan when the UN General Assembly unanimously adopted Bhutan, the Bhutan-led resolution on happiness towards a holistic approach to development. As a follow-up to the resolution, Bhutan convened a high-level meeting on happiness and well-being at the UN headquarters in New York early this year. The meeting was followed by yet another UN declaration, a resolution, UN resolution declaring March 20 as the international Day of Happiness. The political scenario in Bhutan. After the transition to a parliamentary democracy in 2008, the first elected government had the daunting task of forming, consolidating and empowering the new democratic institutions in Bhutan. I would say that it has, done, it has been done commendably despite the expected challenges of the transition. Uh, right now, the tenure of the first elected government is coming to an end, and we will be having the next elections, the second democratic elections, by the middle of next year. Right now, preparations towards the election is gripping newspaper headlines, and we, we have already seen four new political parties coming uh, evolve in the past one year. Under democracy, we have also seen the new institution of monarchy being strengthened under the leadership of the young king. His Majesty also gave, gave us our queen in October last year when he married Her Majesty Queen Jason Pema. Uh, now let me speak about how GNH is being implemented. 
Bhutan has always attempted to define and explain GNH through what it call, calls its four pillars. One, good governance. Two, sustainable socio-economic development. Three, cultural preservation. And four, environmental conservation. I will not really get into the mathematics of uh, GNH because at least a bit complex. It is further divided into nine pillars and uh, it uses 31 different indicators to come up with the G GNH index and then it is further divided into 72 indicators. It's a, it's a bit complex so I will not get into that. In order to align all government policies according to GNH priorities in 2008, the Planning Commission, which is the main body of the government uh, whose responsibility is to come up with the development, developmental roadmap of the country, was renamed as the GNH Commission. Today, all initiatives of the government are divided into policies and projects. Each policy and each project has to undergo a screening test, a GNH screening test, and only if it passes the test, the, uh, the policy or the project gets, gets a go-ahead sign. Now I will move on to the challenges of implementing GNH. There are a lot of challenges of implementing something called GNH. The most obvious challenge or criticism is the virtual impossibility of using mathematical formulae to quantify a subjective and basic human emotion that is happiness. And similarly, there are hundreds of other criticisms from experts, scientists, economists, academics, and many other expert groups. But I will not focus on that because a lot of international conferences have focused on that. I think what has not come out in GNH discourses so far is the challenges of impl implementing GNH on the ground and how the people of Bhutan feel about it. So I will talk about that. There are people or critics of GNH within Bhutan who believe that while Bhutan has advocated GNH very effectively to the outside world, the ceiling has been not so good back home. So there are some who say that GNH has become a rhetoric concept. I will broadly some of the challenges under four topics. Number one, overall legislative challenge. Number two, the lack of a proper policy outlining how GNH would be practiced in Bhutan. Number three, top-down implementation. And number four, idealistic implementation. I'll go back to number one, overall legislative challenge. The biggest transition that defined Bhutan was the transition to democracy in 2008. The whole elections and the preparations towards the transition were based on the constitution back in 2008 which was then in its draft form. And it was only formally enacted by the first democratic election, uh, sorry, uh, the democratic government only after elections. Maybe that is why there was an oversight. Despite the constitution stating GNH as the guiding principle for Bhutan, there was no exercise undertaken to harmonize the then existing laws to the newly enacted constitution. It has not been done even today. It could be one reason why we are struggling to integrate GNH into the governance structure and more so to implement and to make it more practical. The second challenge is the lack of a policy outlining how GNH would be practiced. The problem is also related to the first one. We have already made GNH the development philosophy but we don't have any kind of a policy doc document outlining how GNH would be practiced. In the absence of such a mother document outlining G uh, how GNH would be practiced, there is no formal reference point to base any strategy. With no implementation strategy, all government agencies take it upon themselves to implement GNH in the way they think is best. Such cases have led to complications. I'll share one example. The Education Ministry wanted to infuse GNH principle, uh, principles in schools and the head of the schools, most of the head of the schools that, which are, uh, who are also called principals, were oriented with GNH teaching techniques 
one part of the initiative was to teach the students the essence of meditation so today students are asked during the morning school assembly to close their eyes for one or two minutes and meditate then teachers are advised to begin all classes of the day with a minute or two of meditation I'm not really sure that this initiative has been successful in teaching students the essence of meditation. It has definitely taught students about the physical attributes of how someone should meditate, but not the essence of the main act itself. Imagine what uh, we would have thought as young students if we were told to do the same exercise about eight or nine times a day, all days a week and throughout the year. Here I fear that students may start hating these meditative exercises and the naughty ones who are looking for an excuse not to study may love it but they may be still loving it for the wrong reasons. Actually this example of meditation in school typifies how GNH is being implemented uh, in many agencies in Bhutan. The only channel of formal implementation of GNH happens at the legislative level. Like I outlined earlier, all government initiatives are, are divided into policies and projects and they have to undergo a GNH screening test. Here I would like to say that the practice is rather limited in scope of just giving birth to good policies. Now I'll move, uh, the, the third challenge is top-down implementation. In the absence of a policy to practice GNH, all efforts are right now focused on implementing pro-GNH policies. This has made all GNH initiatives something aspired to be implemented, which naturally gives it a top-down approach. While the implementation of pro-GNH policies is also important, there should be a parallel focus to make it practical and people should be able to relate to it. Herein lies a bigger challenge. Today, the government justifies all its initiatives along GNH lines and it is one of the reasons that there is a GNH fatigue among the citizenry. Today, it seems as if the only experts of GNH are our leaders, senior bureaucrats, bureaucrats, and of course, the Center for Bhutan Studies. And they seem to define all aspects of GNH. Here, the scope of ordinary individual opinion is rather limited. There is definitely more need to have a wider debate on the issue. Some even argue that GNH is being used as a reason, logic and pretext to implement any policy the government wants. The fourth challenge would be idealistic implementation. As expected, the pursuit of something like happiness can only be idealistic in nature. So a big challenge is, is to draw a line between idealism and realism and how to make GNH more practical. In the past few years, many government decisions have inadvertently a very idealistic line. I should also add that it has happened even if decisions were taken to promote GNH values. For example, there are several bans in the country. The sale of plastics is banned, commercial billboards are banned, all form of gambling is banned, the sale of meat is banned on religious days and months. In the Buddhist calendar, the 8th, 10th, 15th, 25th, and 30th of every month are religious days so the meat sale of meat is banned on five days of the month uh, of the month of the Buddhi, uh, of the buddhist calendar the bigger contention is the meat ban on two religious months of the buddhist calendar which corresponds to the first and the fourth months when people including hoteliers tend to stock up meat months in advance leading to a lot of health concerns. Perhaps the most controversial decision of late was the banning of tobacco and tobacco products. Initially when the Tobacco Act became effective on January 1st 2011 last year it was rightly described as a very draconian law and it made someone carrying even one cigarette stick a potential criminal and a smuggler and it was a crime of the fourth degree felony liable to prison terms of a minimum of three years for carrying even a, uh, one cigarette stick. It was an irony at best that the first person arrested was a Buddhist monk who was then sentenced to three years in prison for carrying tobacco products worth less than two US dollars. Later, 
about more than 80 people were arrested. The act attracted a huge public outcry and a country that has never seen public strikes saw a movement against the act through Facebook, the social media. Just for comparison, I would share that some other criminal offenses liable for the same penalty, the fourth degree felony, according to the Bhutanese law, are human trafficking, abduction, rape, robbery, torture, and riot, among others. So a smoker was treated like no other than a rapist. There were several other flaws. The same kind of penalty was not even liable for people who abused marijuana or who abused hard drugs. In June 2011, several provisions in the law were relaxed. But those who smuggled in more than the allowed quantity still await the same fate. Later, His Majesty had to intervene and he granted amnesty to 16 people arrested under the Act. While you can see that social evil like tobacco is banned, the number one killer in Bhutan, alcohol, is readily available in the market. While Bhutan does not produce tobacco, we still commercially produce a lot of alcohol beverages. Early this year, a new state-owned alcohol producing distillery was opened. While the state earns revenue by selling alcohol, it spends more treating people of alcohol-related diseases. By the way, uh, health, health services and education in Bhutan are provided by the state and uh, are free. In 2009 alone, the revenue generation from taxes on alcohol was 19 million neutrums. Neutrums is the official currency of Bhutan. 19 million neutrums. But the government spent 20 million neutrums for the treatment of people suffering from alcohol related diseases. NCDs, non communicable diseases, reportedly account for 6 out of 10 deaths in the country, and alcohol is one of the leading factors for such deaths. Now, look at our nonchalant attitude towards alcohol. That there was a bar in Thimphu uh, two or three years ago, and it was called GNH Bar. This year, the government also declared all Tuesdays of the year as a pedestrian day. Local movement of vehicles within town and city limits is disallowed, and only taxis and public buses are allowed to ply. The movement has again gained a lot of criticism from the media, business community, and all other sectors of the public. Other touchy issues that have been the government's that has been the government's uh, the other touchy issues have been the attempts to ban junk food proposal by one district to implement a dress code, meaning to allow residents only to wear the national dress. There is even a checklist for movie makers, but it has not been endorsed so far, which says that movie actors has to wear only the national dress and to have at least two, two traditional songs in every movie, and there are several other restrictions. Because of some of the examples that I've shared above and many more, some people have developed a negative attitude towards the mention of the name GNH itself. But I'll, uh, but I'll say here that it is not because people are against GNH per se, but they are against the way it is being implemented. Or rather the way in which everything is implemented with the blessings of this holistic concept. So there is a strong need to take a step back, reflect on some basic ground realities and make it more practical. There is a strong need to strategize the implementation of GNH in a way that ordinary people can relate to it. Given the, challenge, uh, given the challenges I've shared above, I would like to stress that the whole philosophy of GNH is still a work in progress in Bhutan today. Under the guidance of our kings, Bhutan has always believed that economic progress is not the only parameter to measure a nation's growth or development. We have tried to measure development by keeping people at the center of the development philosophy. And that is the essence of the philosophy of GNH. Having said that, there are definitely many challenges to implement it. There are challenges at all levels. There are challenges in advocating this development philosophy to the outside world. There are challenges in implementing it back home. And there are challenges to make it more practical. 
Because of the holistic nature of the philosophy of GNH, I believe that GNH is not an end goal. The biggest achievement of Bhutan till date, till date has been our efforts to strive towards having a GNH society. The pursuit of GNH in itself is what matters. But at the end of the day, we are all humans and no human society is perfect. All societies have flaws. We definitely have ours. But we must hope that something good will come out of our pursuit of GNH. And we see hope in the goodness of our people. We saw hope when a taxi driver in November last year returned 90 million neutrums, about USD 1.8 million, to its rightful owner after, after he found it lying by the roadside. He saw an ad on television where the man, man declared that he had lost the money and this taxi driver who found it went back to him and re returned the money. Similarly, we saw hope when a 38-year-old monk came to my newspaper last month to make an announcement. He wanted to pay my paper and give an ad. And his message, in his message, he was calling for patients in need of kidney to contact him. He was willing to donate his kidney for free to anyone in need. So, the story of JNH is not the story of Bhutan alone. It is a story of valuing goodness in human beings. It is a story of valuing small things that make us smile. So I would like to conclude by quoting my king who recently described GNH as nothing else but development with values. Thank you, and Tashi Dalek. Um, thank you, Tashi. That's very interesting and uh, I think also sobering. We have a lot of preconceived uh, notions and uh, media images of Bhutan and GNS and GNS uh, has been portrayed very positively in the international media. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest in it in Thailand. And let me just ask you a couple of questions before we open up uh, to, the, um, to the audience. You mentioned about development with values. And by the way, your King Jigme is very popular in Thailand, very popular. And I think he likes to come to Thailand too, right? He comes here. Uh, and the Queen as well. The development with values, uh, control development really, right? Manage development. This is a similar story in, in many countries, uh, in Asia and elsewhere. What, what lesson can we draw from this and what advice would you have? You know, Myanmar is just opening up now, uh, next door to us in Thailand. And for a latecomer, for a late country, a country that is coming late into economic development, uh, there are a lot of constraints, a lot of challenges. So how do you do it? I mean, how, what do you have, uh, how do you prevent disruptions in development? Uh, what values do you use? I mean, who determines the values in development? And related to this, you know, you mentioned uh, the medical costs exceeds tobacco revenue, right? Uh, and uh, I did notice that, you know, the, the tobacco is banned, alcohol, I meant, uh, but alcohol is allowed. You work in the media and uh, what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, to what extent can you really turn away or uh, deny or resist the tide of liberty and freedom? And people will want to have their, their voices heard and they will want to uh, uh, criticize uh, the government and so on. And, and are you allowed to do that in the media, first of all? And uh, do you think that, that the Bhutanese society will... will uh, Resist? Uh, would they go along with this resistance of, of the globalization tide? So two questions. One, uh, who determines the values of, of development? And for slow development, how do you do it? I think you limit the number of tourists and you also have uh, a lot of these controls in place to, to go slow on development. Uh, but wh who determines and who benefits? You know, in the case of tobacco ban, the alcohol industry, I would imagine, that they don't want to ban alcohol because they make a lot of revenue from alcohol. And the second question is, uh, how do you turn back the tide of globalization, if you can? The first question, 
I think there is always uh, an advantage in being late comers. I think the, uh, it is always wise not to rush. The question is who determines values of something like JNH? I think in the case of Bhutan, we have definitely not rushed the pursuit of JNH. Now, uh, but if you look at uh, look at it, in the uh, everything for Bhutan, the the process of developing uh, developing mathematical parameters. If you look at it, I would say that it was somewhat rushed. The whole scope was given to one research organization, and. There was only limited public discourse on the issue. The discourse was at an international level with interna international experts, but and all the parameters, mathematical parameters, were also derived from these expert meetings. But there was not much interaction with the people. So I think that is a very uh, vital. Uh, process that we have to follow because that is one of the reasons why there is a disconnect today some people believe that uh, actually quite a lot of people believe that uh, GNH is not being implemented well at the, at the grassroots and that is because everything has happened at the very top level you know uh, all the GNH discourses so far if it, I have talked about five international GNH conferences and out of that, the Bhutanese representation might be 20 to 30 percent. It has always been with uh, leaders, experts, scientists, thinkers all over the world. But there has not been any GNH, uh, notable GNH discourses with the public. Public in a sense, with everyone, you know, the common people. There has been some few efforts made, but not really uh, an extensive one. So I think that is also very important to have discourses with everyone and I think such a process should not be rushed uh, so I think uh, in a democracy right now we are a, co a constitutional monarchy but a, but also a dem uh, parliamentary democracy so I think a more disco uh, open discourse is needed and the whole system of developing these values has to be very democratic in nature because right now, like I outlined in the challenges of implementing uh, GNH, you know, it's, I think, one of the critics, uh, one of the criticism against GNH is that it is a very top-down approach. So maybe we need to balance it up with some bottom, bottoms-up initiatives also. Um, the tide of globalization. I think it is only, uh, the second question, the, I think it is only natural for a society, uh, LDC society like ours, or be it Thailand, or you know, in the whole region, to be affected with the tide of globalization. Uh, and alcohol, you know, alcohol. Whenever, uh, actually, I'll just share with the crowd here that whenever topics on alcohol comes up, uh, you know, the general consensus is that it is something to do with culture. Actually, it is. Uh, drinking alcohol is a culture. Many many families in Bhutan won't mind their kids drinking alcohol, but it's a it's an extreme no if they are smoking. So it's it, it's very culture intrinsic. In uh, when I was a student, I uh, went to a uh, went to a traditional village back in eastern Bhutan, and we did a survey uh, in a village, and we found out that 95% of the villagers uh, the first thing they have in the morning after they get up is liquor, is nothing else. So drinking alcohol is very culture intrinsic. Uh, but still, you know, uh, I think there is also a, uh, uh, a negative feeling against this government, particularly this government, this elected government, for implementing, uh, for initiating some steps in the name of GNH. For example, I'll, I'll just share that uh, what is often publicized about Bhutan is that the, the number one revenue generating potential in Bhutan uh, is hydropower. Actually, if there is a, uh, if a, uh, if a uh, study is done 
there is one potential which is even bigger than hydropower and that is the lottery business and my paper exposed a lot of corruption in this lottery business actually Bhutan used to produce this lottery sell it in southern India and the revenue generated was in billions even more than what Bhutan would be earning from hydropower in the year 2020 uh, by the way by, uh, Bhutan has a written agreement with India that it will uh, supply 10,000 megawatt of hydropower to India by the year 2020 even the revenue generated then would be lesser than this lottery business so but there was a lot of corruption involved uh, in the lottery business so there was a detailed investigation done probed by my paper and the final decision of the government was to close down the business close down the business with the justification that it is gambling it is against GNH so so you see a lot of uh, the government has taken a lot of this kind of decisions actually what would be would have been des desirable was a detailed investigation and to resume the business and make it clean what we what we asked for was to clean up the business but the government decided to close down the business so this kind of uh, this kind uh, there are quite a lot of this kind of questions uh, dr tedan also asked about media freedom I think right now, uh, by the way, Bhutanese media was, uh, private media was allowed in Bhutan only in the year 2006. Uh, before that, there was only one uh, newspaper, state-owned, not state-controlled, but state-owned. And there was uh, one broadcasting station which aired both television and the radio. It, was, it is called the BBS, Bhutan Broadcasting Service. And just to share that, uh, just to share with you all that Bhutan got television only in the year 1990. I think it was in 1999. It was also the same year that Bhutan got internet. But after 2006, after the advent of the private media, I think uh, there has been a drastic shift in uh, in the content of the media also. Right now, the the media is uh, very open. I would say very open. And uh, the media freely criticizes the government just before 2006 i think it was not done the government was not criticized and not uh, only uh, it's very difficult to say that the media was controlled then but i think the media did not see the need also to criticize the government and moreover uh, it was directly uh, bhutan was a monarchy then so there were a lot of uh, other subtleties uh, because of which there was uh, the media, uh, the government was not criticized. But after 2006, and so far, I think uh, the media has become a lot more uh, open and a lot more freer also.